uh, there were several things unexpected, like this part. And uh, last one for us, we have a delay. I think we will have just tomorrow here. And several other people tomorrow they are coming. But this is great because good Lord is someone that is about relaxing, thinking, meditating, and maybe this intimate atmosphere is going to be fantastic for us. Uh, the current circus show, Zeeven Tiger Zeeven Mante, is actually a joint uh, space for three curatorial, uh, I would say, practices. And each of us decided to depart with a reflection. We had DEFNIS uh, uh, event in December and Charlotte postponed her event for the closing of the program with the extension. And here, second and third, the anonymous. There are four positions uh, we concede, and this is specifically dedicated to Sarkis, Sarkis practice, and the anonymous series. The series with another title existed before, that work specifically responded to the art history. And during my conversation with Sarkis on the phone yesterday, he specifically wanted me to tell a moment from his history of exhibitions. He was in 78 in Westphalia in Münster, and the Krikshat piece was censored. And he was met, and he stood behind the director, and he read the opening speech when the director was lit. So uh, there's some photos of this uh, moment. But the most important thing is today we are going to learn how to heal men. And Ruth is going to teach us, and maybe men deserve to be killed. Uh, I approached Ruth with a very specific quotation. I have been reading Tibur with Egemen, semiotics since a while, and long time with Fulia Gandhi, with Charlie, with Egemen Demija. I shared this quote, and this quotation became a space for extending our understanding of Christianity how we create solidarity and also more important to politics today. I want to read this. Read it, the summary of today. What civilization has done, what civilization has done to women's bodies is no different than what it is done to the earth, to children, to the sick, to the proletariat, in short, to everything that's not supposed to talk. And in general, to whatever knowledge of powers of government and management don't want to hear, which is thus relegated to exclusion from all recognized activity related to the role of the witness. Tigun is a Paris collective dating great two years journalists, and still we don't know who they are. There are some old grumpy men drinking some drinking <laughs> some uh, Drinking in some Paris bars, I'm sure, but they decided that us not to know them. That's okay. And Ruth specifically trigger, was triggered by this quotation, and she would share what triggered her. Let me introduce her. She's one of the most powerful voices I have known in the last 20 years of my creative journey. She's Fearful, she is not afraid of anyone, and maybe um, her ideas about education is more radical than any other person I know. Uh, she created the documentary to work with Roger Burger. I remember that 2007 summer, and I remember the teapot from the customer of them. Fuck yeah, it was a great show. Uh, and I want to quickly read her recent exhibitions and the titles of these exhibitions gives the notion of her creating. Amazing titles. We have always amazing titles. The Mental Body and Stay Alive to Life. Resilience in Times of Covid and Many First Drive. And then she made this series called Sleeping Within a Wangling Dreaming of a Life. And she did this in Athens, Prague, Beijing and Stuttgart. We have to do it in Berlin. And another great uh, project is 
an autograph of an autograph on Sanye Records with the editor agency Ambulance and Analysis. And finally, approaching the museum with migration in mind, she published numerous essays, lectures over the last 30 years. It's never enough with you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and teach us how to kill men. Disappoint you, no killing of men planned. <laughs> and the movie is uh, a great reference, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I have to. no interest in technology and no understanding of technology and the result of it is that we cannot play them from my file which I have accumulated all my other images so what we we and I have to thank Dominic what we did for the last one half hours is to try to find a solution and our solution now is that we're going to use two computers and two different versions of showing things so bear with me because we have to, you know, negotiate this a little bit. So my, the title of my uh, talk is Witnessing from Statement to Action. It's also called the first draft because um, I'm in no way finished with thinking about what my argument, I threw this out. <laughs> it means I just like, okay, here it is. And I uh, then realized that maybe I need much more time to really make this very um, succinct. And so I hope that you will give me lots of productive criticism so I can further uh, my ideas around this. And so I'm very grateful for this group here. And the talk is um, dedicated to Haisan, to Natasha, and to Aisha. So you heard this, I'm going to repeat these quotes from Tico. What civilization has done to women's bodies is not different than what it's done to the earth, to children, to the sick, to the proletariat, in short, to everything that isn't supposed to talk, and in general, to whatever the knowledge powers of government and management don't want to hear, which is thus relegated to exclusion from all recognized activity relegated to the role of a witness. I spent a long time trying to grapple with this quote. At first it offended me. Despite its rousing radicality in tone and despite the fact that it's easy for people like me to feel sympathy for the critique of the knowledge powers of government and management. There was something about that catalog women's bodies, the earth, the children, the sick, and the proletariat that irked me. So I tried to understand why I was triggered and what the quote really meant. Matters are not made easier by the fact that the quote must have been translated from French, and there might be clearer ways of expressing that oneself. To simplify it, the main claim is that government renders passive several entities it doesn't want to hear from. Those thus passivized can only look at what is happening, so to say, they can only witness it. Be that as it may, I can remain disproving of the quote. Taken out of context, it is perplexing that women's bodies are focused on rather than women themselves, especially when listed alongside the proletariat. And what kind of list is this anyway? Women's body, the earth, the proletariat. This totalizing rhetoric lumps together diverse entities simply because all of them might be said to have had suffered oppression from powers that be, such as government, management, or the knowledge powers of government and management. How about adding capitalism into the mix, or patriarchy? What gets lost here are the specific relationalities of the oppressed entities to their specific oppressors. 
This is disrespectful of these entities in that they are only seen and connected to each other by their shared victimhood. It also makes it near impossible to find the adequate tools to fight back against the oppressors. Admittedly, the quote by Tikkun is more than 20 years old. Nowadays, we have learned not to universalize victimhood. We've also learned not to universalize women's bodies. Take Ursula von der Leyen's body. The body of the President of the European Commission, whose most recent deed was to unfreeze EU funds to Hungary, despite that country's abominable undemocratic rulership. Take Marsha P. Johnson's body. The body of the LGBTQ activist who spearheaded the Stonewall Uprising of 1969. Take the body of Audrey Tan. The body of Taiwan's first minister of digital affairs who defines themselves as post-gender and accepts any pronoun people want to describe me with online. Depicted here, share the cyber attack expertise at an Israeli cyber week. Take the body of Vivian Silver, here in the middle. A feminist peace activist killed during the Hamas attack on the kibbutz Be'eli on October 7. Just as the subjectivities they host, none of these bodies can be said to be relegated to the role of a witness. Lack of differentiation in language and thinking serve to reify the oppressive relationship tikkun means to criticize. Unfortunately, this makes the quote one in a long genealogy of patriarchal statements, and here we will probably differ, which claim to speak in defense of women, but what they really do is to drown out the voice of women. Moreover, and this is where I finally come to the topic of tonight's paper, I don't buy into the dichotomy of activity and passivity, nor into the idea that the role of a witness actually is a passive one. In order to determine the status and relevance of a witness statement, we have to ask many questions, amongst them, who is bearing witness and to what? But most of all, we need to ask, how is something being witnessed? And what does the how do? For example, how does witnessing change from a statement into an act, into an action? How can we become visible to each other in acts of witnessing? And how does image making, be it film, art, or curation, contribute? I believe that the creation of visibility, which seeks to impact on the conditions of visibility remains one of the cornerstones of political activism. In this respect, visibility and anonymity, the theme, the title of this symposium, do not exclude each other. Both can be effective political tools, as long as they remain cognizant of the conditions of their own production. Witnessing as an action navigates this terrain, and here I would like to share a few examples of this kind of navigation.
beginning of the 1981 film by Marlene Gomez called The Question of Silence in English and the translation of the Dutch title is The, the Quietness Around Christina and In this film, a forensic psychiatrist who we saw with her husband at the beginning of this of the clip is tasked by the court of law to assess the mental state of three women who we see who are introduced afterwards who brutally beat the owner of a boutique to death. Their act is seemingly without motivation and neither of the women know each other prior to this event. The psychiatrist Janine van der Boos, a liberal upper middle class woman in a good marriage, attempts to talk with each of these women, but they successfully evade her probing. We witness how one of them remains mute, the second talks too much about anything but the killing, mostly about food, and the third challenges each question of the psychiatrist by turning the tables on her. What we don't get to see as viewers is the event itself, and thus for us, just as for the psychiatrist, their motivation remains concealed. It is only when Janine van der Boos begins to acknowledge her own relationality that she begins to understand what has happened. The more she puts herself into the picture by acknowledging the structural violence which pits her as representative of the state against her clients, while at the same time oppressing all women, women in one way or other, the more the women open up to her and the more we viewers get to see. We start to bear witness to their intersectional experiences with patriarchy and we come to realize that we ourselves might be implicated too. This is probably why most of the times when I saw the film in a cinema in the 1980s and the 1990s, the audience was split in their reaction to the film according to gender lines. In the end, the film reveals to us that the killing was the culmination of suppressed female anger. It must be mentioned though that the film in no way idealizes this act nor does it allow an escape from the catastrophic reality into which the women have catapulted themselves. There is no happy end. There is, however, an ethical dimension in the film's rendition of solidarity between the women in the film, despite their differences. As it turns out, there were other witnesses to the killing, women who did not stop it, nor did they leave the scene. They simply stood by and watched, and no one told on them. When Van der Boos is asked to attest the women's mental state at trial, she declares them sane, triggering a wave of indignation amongst the representatives of the legal apparatus. At one point, the judge even feels compelled to appeal to her professionalism, urging her to reconsider her assessment. A fierce exchange ensues between the prosecutor and the psychiatrist. See for yourselves a clip from this trial scene. And the trial scene is actually in this film uh, a major part.
As if out of seemingly nowhere. Oh, I'm missing the second one. Sorry, there's another one. This is from the end of the film.
by the psychiatrist herself, who takes up and leaves the courtroom, refusing to play witness any longer. Nevertheless, it remains a performance which has real effects on people. Indeed, the film itself never pretends to stage a revolution, but insists on the separation of reality and representation. Yet the laughter, first a solitary act of one of the killers, then taken up by others, even by cinematic form of address, transmission or mobilization involving the audience allows for the utopia of abolition and for a shared sense of solidarity or maybe simply for the sense of sharing. 
Malene Gorris' film has this concrete project, the desire to evoke a feminist audience which does more than simply look at the film and instead constitutes itself as a community of solidarity. As an exhibition maker, I've learned much from this film, and though I cannot claim that I've had much success with it, it has been my aspiration to evoke with my work such an audience. Now we need to switch. The court is genius, like it. Yeah. And I'm sorry it's in such bad quality, but no, it's very really good. Yeah. yeah. In the fall of 2019, I was charged with building up a new cultural institution in Washington, D.C., embedded in a non profit healthcare organization focusing on HIV and LGBTQIA plus care. The venue of what became known as the Corner at Whitman Walker was supposed to be ready in late spring of 2020. But I decided to go ahead and open an exhibition in January, although the premises had not yet been fully built out by then. I just show, show you this pope, um, uh, uh, pope which is so as not to romanticize this idea of being embedded in a healthcare institution when you're trying to show art. You know, these are like, I mean, this admittedly is during COVID times, but the, you know, all of these were necessary, except for our box, where we were collecting money for the institution, were necessary um, to have in the space. The exhibition was called When We First Arrived. In retrospect, that proved a lucky scheme. given what we know, now know of events that year. But I had another urgency than COVID on my mind. I had learned that around 7,000 children seeking asylum were being detained by the US federal government at the time after they had crossed the US-Mexico border. Minimum standards of care as defined by the 1997 Flores Settlement were not being met. The Flora Settlement pertains to a court case in which detained children were granted basic human rights by the USA, for example, access to food and drinking water or to doctors and lawyers. I find it quite interesting that these were not established before this court case. Under this settlement, I mean, we always used to say China doesn't have a con concept of human rights, but the United States also doesn't have a concept of human rights before it goes to court and someone fights for it. Under this settlement, a group of Flores lawyers gained access to the detention centers together with some translators and collected witness statements from the children, collated in the so-called Flores Report. Anyone who read these harrowing testimonies, as I did, would become aware that there was a humanitarian and public policy crisis ongoing. And yet, after a few weeks of scandal caused by the publication of photographs in the media of children kept in cages, the public discourse around the issue had all but died down. The artists, Mary Ellen Carroll and Lucas Michael, you see here to the right, sent out the Flores report to other artists, asking them to make and donate a work no larger than A2, taking up and reflecting a witness statement and clearer, clearly indicating which statements they were referring to. Here you see in the middle um, the work by Pope L. And here he's actually uh, quoting this statement. It, it might be too washed out, but it's, there are uh, many ages here, they are every, they're very full, many 60 people in each cell, aged sometimes more, it's, it's, it's a cage sometimes more. I am in this cage with my infant son, sick with cough, a fever, the lights are all the time, are on all the time. My son is so cold, he feels frozen to the touch, and that's, uh, he's referencing on the painting, the page, from a 17-year-old girl from Honduras, with her infant son, and from when that statement was taken. The idea was to 
sold, one to sell these works and pass on the full proceeds to three activist professional networks, Terra Firma, a clinic in the Bronx providing mental health care to unaccompanied minors, Innovation Law Lab supporting the Flores Laureus and Team Brownsville, an initiative of residents in the Texas border town who were lending practical support to whomever was crossing the border in or near Brownsville. Secondly, DYKWTCA, which stands for Do You Know Where the Children Are? The title of Mary Ellen Carroll's and Lucas Michael's initiative was concerned with finding ways of making the children's testimonies heard and acknowledged more widely. They figured that the transmission of the testimonies through artistic media would allow other people and those already initiated access to the children's stories and potentially provoke them into taking action themselves. Mostly, they hoped to get the children's voices heard as their stories were not being presented by mainstream media. What they did was to ask artists to be co-witnesses. The care that went into thinking about how the works of art would then be sold was, in my experience, extraordinary. And I can later on talk about that if you're interested, because it was a really interesting model. They managed, for example, that the buyer keep the original testimony with the work of art and continue to disseminate the knowledge about the crisis by word of mouth. In other words, they asked the buyers as well to share into the witnessing. I decided that it would be essential to show um, Do You Know Where the Children Are's collection of works in an exhibition before they were sold off at Washington, D.C., a city full of law and policy makers, as well as 5,000 employees of the World Bank, seemed the place to do so. The problem was how to, the curatorial problem, was how to fit 123 artworks by, amongst others, Anna Dalcikova, Trisha Donnelly, Dan Graham, Ashley Hunt, Jesse Presley Jones, Carrie Leibowitz, Simon Mann, Julie Meritu, Carlos Mata, Paul Bell, Rob Pruitt, Michael Rakowitz, Ugo von Dinone, Amy Silman, Laurie Simmons, Pamela Sneed, A.L. Steiner, Lawrence Wiener, Summer Wheat, on the walls of the two rooms of the corner at Whitman Walker. Moreover, this being a premature exhibition, we did not have an audience yet, nor could we afford a publicist. And on top of that, DC is a music and theater city, not much interested in contemporary art, despite the many museums in town. A decade of rampant gentrification had just reached its zenith, and most artists who were not leaving for the coasts or further had moved to Baltimore, which was not even an hour away, but might as well have been on another planet. It was clear that the majority of people we could expect at the corner would not be used to looking at contemporary art. Finally, I had another quite serious problem. I did not yet have any staff and no budget either, as this was an exhibition that wasn't planned. So how could Lucas, Mary Ellen and I be as efficient as possible in installing the show? To cut a long story short, the whole process felt more like a guerrilla action than the inception of an institution. Healthcare workers from Whitman Walker and people off the street would come by and help out a while, hacking over 100 standard frames with the glue gun and matchsticks to avoid um, um, what you call the um, Mary Ellen drove the works from DC, uh, from New York to DC in Lucas Michael's car. We didn't have any insurance for them. For two ways, two days we did nothing but frameworks. I had cracked the room by painting a white horizontal line at 140 centimeters throughout the two rooms, inspired by Edward Krasinski's Blue Stripes. And we hung the works along this line, side by side, frames touching each other, so we didn't have to, to measure out anything. I had come up with a display which allowed visitors to read the many works populating the art words populating the artworks in a similar way 
to how they would read a book from left to right. On each wall, a few works were kicked out of this narrative, um, flow and hung extra to make a special point, either thematically or aesthetically. Here, this one on the right, for instance, that's picked out is, is, says the baby is losing weight and so am I. After the opening, which was populated mostly by the Whitman Walker Health Community, I found out that the serendip found out that the serendipitously located corner at Whitman Walker at a corner of two busy streets on the ground floor with large bay windows had constant walk-ins. Especially after we kept the entrance door wide open during business hours, illegally hid a little loudspeaker in the facade and played DC Go Home music. Despite of COVID closures and restrictions, we had over 700 visitors, but more importantly, people came and stayed and wanted to talk afterwards. The symposium we organized with the lawyers, doctors, activists, policy makers became another opportunity to widen the scope of what witnessing could mean in respect to the Flores testimonies. And I have to say that ever since um, it became popular, few, now it's not so popular anymore, but for a few years it was really popular to call um, organizing a symposium to curate a symposium. And this irked me. <laughs> So I started to curate symposia. And in this case, I'll show you a few pictures of it. For instance, it was very, very um, um, structured in the way that we set up the chairs, we set up the moments of lecturing, we set up moments of witnessing that lecturing. So we had participants, not only the doctors and the lawyers, and really, um, and, and activists, but we also had, for instance, a janitor from the law, um, a lawyer from a, a, a commercial law firm, and a student receiving these statements and then directing, directly responding to them with a, a, the same kind of um, a privilege and position, and we made sure that this would happen as the person who was giving the expert statement. So we try to get rid of the uh, hierarchies between these kind of um, uh, expressions, vocal and, and content expressions, uh, by the way that we curated it. And it was, very, it was actually really ritualized. And what I found interesting is that even some high government people, like the senior director of the Migrant Rights and Justice Program at the Women's Refugee Commission at the time, or former Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees and Migration, participated in this and also adjusted to this rather quirky format of how we were doing the things. The box in the middle was there, and we were sitting very close to each other, and the box in the middle was there to, to put in statements, and in between lectures, these statements were, were read out. And by the way, this former assistant secretary for state, of state was the secretary of Obama's time, and don't think that there were less children in detention during Obama's time. To remind ourselves that this is not a situation in which we can... Wait, I want to show you some pictures of this. Because maybe you can see from this photo, I mean a photo is always, you know, a construction, but it, I think the photographer tried to, try to show some of this activity of, of, of witnessing the statements and listening to the statements. I mean, for a whole day you learn to do some things, right? This woman, for instance, she's a pediatrist working out of New York, um, does research on ne uh, neurology, and um, she was talking about secondary trauma and how that not only impacts on the way the brain is built, but actually can go all the way into DNA, which was new knowledge at the time. And so these kids 
are actually being traumatized, second and third degree trauma. So their grandchildren will suffer from this. It's not just something that happens and then it is over. So she was explaining this to us. Um, and he got me and was that And this is uh, the guy who is the leader of Terra Firma in the Bronx. And Francisco is answering. This is the florist lawyer. Some other people were. And this was my favorite person, the guy who organized the kind of residence out in Bronxville, um, Texas. He was super emotional, but also extremely impressive. To remind ourselves that this is not a situation which we can comfortably project onto the U.S., I'd like to insert here a little clip from a conversation held with filmmaker Agnieszka Holland on the occasion of the screening of her 2023 film, The Green Border. This is a film which is at now, at right now in, in um, German cinemas, and I urge you all to go and see it. But I also urge you to take a friend and not go see it alone. <laughs> It's one of the things that kept me up last night because I went yesterday. <laughs> One of the practices that this film is, is describing is that they're constantly getting thrown back across that border. So the first time they cross that border, they think they've made it, and then they get thrown back four or five times. And a lot of not, there's not just suffering, there's also deaths. And um, this was a big thing in Poland. Uh, because uh, Kaczynski really tried to um, suppress this knowledge and in one interview, and that's what Agnieszka Holland says, uh, says you, the US only lost the war with Vietnam because there were media images and so that's what provoked Agnieszka Holland to, to start to make this film and they made it in a very, very short time. So she says that images need to be made and in that way she's witnessing, this is I think an act of witnessing through art. And she says voices need to be given space and I think this is, um, she's saying that it's the responsibility of cultural producers to witness in a transitive way, in a way that allows 
for the agency of the original witnesses. I'd like to end today's talk with a short look at filmmaker Alice Diop's Saint Omer from 2022. This film, infinitely more crafted, more complex in its content, more layered in its aesthetic language than the question of silence, but also made 40 years later, plays on many of the same topoi as its predecessor. And in fact, I'm absolutely convinced that Dio knows the question of silence. Just as a question of silence, saint Omer plays out its decisive arguments in a judicial court. In fact, the courtroom is the main setting of the film. It too centralizes the relationship between ships between women, but here the principal figures are two. Laurence Pouli, a woman who has killed her 14-month-old baby, and Rama, a woman who has traveled to, from Paris to saint Omer, especially to witness this trial, witness the perpetrator, who is, like herself, Senegalese living in force. She is no impartial witness, for she wants to, has committed to, is supposed to, write a book on the whole story. I'll show you two scenes from this film. The first one is from the beginning of the trial. Monsieur Lucier, fait en fait. is of her own doing, that she is in control of both intimacy and distance. And indeed, for the most part, Laurence is fixed by the gaze of the legal apparatus, the gaze of racism, in this case, an effect of French colonialism, the gaze of those bearing witness about her, her actions, her motivations. It seems that the French legal system motivate, in the French legal system, motivations and crime need to be made to cohere in order for the judicative to come to a sentencing. In philosopher Francais and Brassel's review of the film, the author quotes Foucault, who described this as the legal system's need for supplementary material. It remains entirely unclear to me whether the strange answers that Laurence gives to the questions she's asked during the court's proceedings are completely gaga, crazy, or a subversive strategy to escape the straitjacket she understands she is being forced into, or whether her answers are queer in the sense that they are so far out of any register of what a hegemonic violent apparatus defines as rationality that they simply don't fit. In Zara Ahmed's terms, they are willful. One might also call them wily. Be that as it may, Laurence does not succeed in escape, escaping incarceration by the system 
by the well-meaning representatives of power, 40 years onwards most are women now, yet they're white women, and especially by the film's pristine but stark cadrage. And Rama witnesses this, sees it all, feels the pain, stitching this experience into her own life, being active. This activity sometimes includes being paralyzed from the shock of the violence that seeps through the wood of the courtroom walls. But it also leads her to connect to Laurence's mother or to mull over her own relationship to her mother. When Laurence Coulis is deadened, where Laurence Coulis is deadened, Rama is alive. Until towards the end of the film, with a single look and a smile, Laurence Coulis changes that. And that's the last clip we're going to look. watch.
saying to Allah with that look, you are me and I am you, or you are not me and I am not you. In any case, the Most Holy acknowledges Mama, and by doing so, she implicates her. But Janine van den Boos makes the decision to be implicated in female solidarity, and this decision frees her. Rama is forced into relationality, and I'm not sure what it means. But I think that what she is thus forced to understand, to bear witness to, is that we are all alone, and that our only way forward is to understand this radical loneliness and become responsible for it. It is our burden to our obligation, not only to witness, but to represent the complexity of power relations in this act of witnessing, and to take action by becoming solidaric with those around us who are disenfranchised, even if we might not like them, even if we might not gain anything from for ourselves, not even the pleasure of identification, even if we might lose something.